today I'm going to talk to you about understanding atypical brain development insights from eye tracking and neuroimaging. Um, so I'm going to start with my acknowledgement slide because I don't want it to get short shrift at the end. Um, I was really so blessed um, in my time at UC Davis to work with incredible collaborators and colleagues and brilliant trainees, as it says on the slide. Um, so the truth is I had to pick and choose the stories I wanted to tell you today so as not to keep you here all night, for real. Um, so I've, I've, and that's a great problem to have. And as I reflect on that, I think what, what, a, what a really fortunate person I've been to be affiliated with all these people. Um, the ones in bold are ones um, who are directly involved in work that I'm going to talk about tonight. But everyone on this slide has been important to everything I've done so far. And so I owe it all to everyone who has um, been a part of my intellectual journey. Um, so I've chosen to focus on two specific examples of how my lab has used eye tracking and neuroimaging to gain insight to the atypically developing brain. But I'm leaving out work that I've done collaboratively with many of you who are here in this room, um, including work on auditory and multisensory processing in autism, on the mirror neuron system and gesture processing in autism, the two-thirds power law, um, and how that affects the way that people with autism see things, work on structural brain um, and functional brain changes which preclude the clinical manifestation of FAXTAS, which is fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome, which was discovered by uh, Rondi Hagerman in this room, um, and work on understanding autistic identity and neurodiversity. Um, so all of that's being left out, <laughs> but I mention it because, alas, um, know that I love all of these projects and all of the people that I've worked with and, and all my collaborators equally. Um, it's kind of like your children, right, having to choose some of them to present. But alas, we only have an hour today. So these are the stories that I uh, want to tell today, the examples I choose that, that are going to speak to these things. Um, and just as a side note, these stories that I'm going to tell often start with running hundreds, literally, of neurotypical children and sometimes adults to determine the ne necessary task parameters and the expected thresholds and age-related changes, et cetera. Um, that are, that, but today, I'm going to focus on the atypical data. Um, so for example one, um, I'm going to talk about dorsal ventral stream processing, so visual processing. I'm going to talk about work that we've done in autism and the Fragile X spectrum, um, including Fragile X syndrome and uh, the Fragile X premutation or carriers of Fragile X. And then, for example, too, I'm going to talk about limbic system circuitry, so amygdala, hippocampus, the limbic system, often thought of as the sort of emotional brain. And I've got examples in autism and also the fat Fragile X spectrum, so Fragile X syndrome and then girls or those with mosaicism and premutation carriers. So those are the two examples we'll try to get through today. Now, I'm going to talk about um, autism and Fragile X as both being spectrums. So both of them have a wide spectrum of involvement. Um, in autism, we have genetic and phenotypic heterogeneity, so we really don't know the genes of autism, and they're likely to be different for different people who have autism. Um, and we have a spectrum of, of symptom profiles. Um, and likely there are sub-phenotypes, and many in this room and some which I've collaborated with are trying to still define. Um, in Fragile X, that whole spectrum of Fragile X involvement, we have genetic homogeneity, so we know the gene responsible for Fragile X, um, but phenotypic heterogeneity in a number of different ways. So you can be mosaic for Fragile X syndrome, meaning some of the cells in your body are expressing the good X versus the bad X, what have you. Um, that could be repeat size or methylation mosaicism. Girls with Fragile X, of course, since it's an X-linked disorder, um, have that neuroprotection of having another X chromosome. So there's a range of FMRP, which is the protein product of the FMR1 gene. Um, and there's a protective effect of, you know, effect of having that second X. We also have another way that it's a spectrum is we have premutation carriers, also known as you know, carriers of fragile X. 
meaning that they can pass on the mutated form of the gene, and sometimes it can expand to a full mutation. Um, but, the, but they themselves have normal to near normal fragile X protein. They have some elevated messenger RNA, um, which we think is neurotoxic, et cetera. So when we look at the premutation, which is something that I have to say, when I joined the field, when I first met David, and we were both postdocs at Stanford, um, Rondi was on the cutting edge of that work, looking at premutation carriers and what their involvement might be. But at that time, it was still a real heretical idea, right? Um, and it was like, there's, you know, if you're a carrier, your only issue is that you, you know, might pass the gene on to your offspring in a, an expanded form, and they might have fragile X syndrome. Um, but for Rondi's very keen observation and lots of work that then I joined when I came to UC Davis, it's now known that there is, in fact, quite a bit of involvement um, in carriers or those who are premutation carriers of fragile X. They have a mild cognitive phenotype, usually, um, but pretty strong anxiety phenotype. Um, and then they have this elevated message, which, which can lead to neurotoxicity that causes, in a good percentage of especially the men uh, carriers, this neurodegenerative disease known as FAXTAS, or Fragile X Tremor Ataxia Syndrome, which again was, was completely discovered by Rondi. Um, because I'm going to talk about autism and Fragile X, but Fragile X is a, is a relatively lesser known um, of the two disorders, I'm just going to give a little bit of extra background on Fragile X. Um, that's, you know, not necessarily true of people at the Mind Institute that are in this room, but other people, it's, it's relatively less known than autism. So Fragile X syndrome is the most common, heritable form of developmental disability. Um, it's an X-linked disorder, as I've always met, already mentioned, so boys are more severely affected um, than girls. And in terms of the phenotype, there's a cognitive sort of general delay, but more pronounced math, spatial, and language problems. Um, and in terms of the psychiatric phenotype, uh, anxiety really is the most prominent. Um, so you'll see that weaving through the work that I'm doing in both, uh, that I'm going to show you in both disorders. Um, it's a single gene defect um, that's responsible for Fragile X. Uh, it was discovered around uh, 1991. Um, so in, in the time that I've been doing this work, it was just recently discovered when I came on the scene. Um, and the mutation of that gene turns off the production of fMR1 protein, also known as fMRP. And it turns out that so sometimes our genes are turned on and off. It doesn't make that much of a difference. But that particular protein product is very essential. It does essential things like uh, dendritic spine formation and synaptic connectivity. So a decrease or a decrement in fMRP can have really large in, uh, impact in terms of cognition. Um, so and about 40% of children with uh, Fragile X syndrome meet criterion for autism. So those are also very like high connections between the two um, conditions that I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so one might ask, why study visual processing, that first example that we're going to go through today, in autism and Fragile X spectrums? So many aspects of the phenotype of both autism and Fragile X spectrum might be due to differences in the way the brain takes in and organizes visual information. Um, and this is a, a thought that I had early on in my career. It, 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 at the beginning, it was a little bit of more of a heretical thought. Now more people are sort of warming to the idea. Um, but in fact, the way that uh, people with both conditions are taking in visual information may in fact really explain a bunch of the phenotype. Um, in autism spectrum, you see basic sensory processing dif differences. Um, and some of the social differences may be, in fact, this is sort of the premise of a lot of the work that I'm going to present, may be, in fact, downstream from more primary processing or attentional differences in those individuals. Um, for example, biological motion processing. So that's the, the, the uh, figure that you see depicted up here. Oftentimes we look at biological motion processing um, through what's called point light walkers. So putting, uh, in the olden days, you actually put lights on the joints of, of people with black suits on, and then you 
took pictures of them in a dark room. Now you can do it all via the computer. In Fragile X Spectrum, you also see um, differences in visual processing, so difficulty in numerical cognition, but also spatial temporal skills and visual motor kinds of tasks. So all of these things are known about the phenotype. And in my body of research since I started back in, you know, as a postdoc or so back in about 1998, 99, um, we were looking at these things. And I was really thinking about how when you take in visual information in the world, it can actually explain some of what we see phenotypically. So then I wanted to know what's going on in the brain and where are those differences? So the, there have been a, a purported dorsal stream difference hypothesized in both Fragile X and in autism. Um, and so the dorsal pathway, as many of you know, now uh, with recognition now that these pathways are not wholly separable and there's much crosstalk between them, this dissociation is still basically correct, especially for low level visual processing. So we're gonna focus on the motion information that's handled by the dorsal stream. Um, but essentially information from the visual system comes in through the retinas, it takes a little pathway down to V1 and visual cortex, and it takes one of two pathways through the brain, either sort of dorsally through the, the parietal area, um, and that's your motion information, spatial relation, and sort of visually guided reaching, or it takes a ventral pathway down through the temporal lobe of the brain, and that's your more form identification, object recognition, and representation, color, those kinds of things. Um, so it has long been thought, even before people like myself started looking at this in infants, that there was a dorsal stream issue um, in both conditions. And so my earliest work, like my very first R01 looking at this in infants with, with fragile X, really um, focused on that dorsal ventral dissociation and sort of looking experimentally at, at, at whether that held true and then if we could find out some more about that. Um, so what we do know about individuals with, with Fragile X syndrome is that visual processing is not a global difference. It's, it's rather the differences are, are rather specific. So children are worse um, on spatial than perceptual tasks. So like the task of building a model with these blocks. Um, there's three examples on the right of, of children with Fragile X trying to replicate that model. You can see the difficulty they have with that. And then there was some early work before I started my work on uh, direction identification thresholds for motion stimuli in adolescents and adults. So we knew already that there was some issue with being able to detect motion, detect, you know, motion patterns um, in very basic visual stimuli. So with that context, I started a program of research for looking at this in very young um, infants with Fragile X syndrome. And let me just say here that much of the vision science work in this Fragile X infant data that I'm gonna show you um, was spearheaded by uh, someone named Faraz Farzin, who it was a brilliant graduate student in my lab, um, who's gone on to have a truly stellar career as a leader in the tech industry and working at several companies, the names of which all of you in this room are familiar with, um, literally. Um, and so that's, I just wanted to give a shout out to Faraz because much of the work that I'm gonna show you um, was part of the work that she did in my lab as a graduate student and some of it was part of her dis dissertation work. So the first um, paper that we published on this in Infants with Fragile X was looking at whether we could sort of unpack this dorsal versus ventral stream processing in infants. And we would put stimuli like what I'm showing up here on the slide on an eye tracker for infants with fragile X. Of course, we can't have direction um, kinds of experiments. We can't say, um, what do you see? Or <laughs> push a button if you do see this or don't see this. So all of the eye tracking work pretty much that I've been doing in the lab, particularly with the very young kids, is what we call passive viewing. Literally just look at the screen, that's all you have to do. So we, our job is only to make the stimuli interesting enough that they'll look at it, 
and the visual system will take care of the rest. So if they look at us, uh, the screen, and imagine this one quadrant here is, is um, the screen of the eye tracker. And of course, the infrared sensors are embedded in the screen. So if they look, it catches the corneal refraction of their eyes, and we see exactly where that baby is looking. One side of the screen is equiluminant gray. There's nothing to see there. So they will always look at the side that has something interesting to see. Um, so it's super simple in that sense. And then all we have to do is parametrically vary the contrast or the, or the you know, how high a contrast the stimuli are um, so that they can see it or not. So really high contrast are easy, stimuli are easy to see and your eyes will snap right to it. But if we lower the contrast, it'll be harder and harder to see. And then it'll go down to 50% chance that you're looking on the correct side of the screen. Okay, So that's the, the premise behind this, this looking time. And we had first order or luminance-defined data uh, stimuli. And that looks like this, almost gray and black stripes. right? And we also had second order or texture-defined stimuli. Now, to know why we use stimuli like this, like I won't, I won't unpack the whole story because it'll take too long. But essentially, I took a play out of the playbook of psychophysicists that had been working in human vision in adults for a very long time. So we didn't have to reinvent those wheels. And we knew that texture-defined stimuli was liked much more by the dorsal stream of the brain than was luminance-defined stimuli. So we had this quadrant, right? We had static stimuli and we had moving stimuli, and it was either luminance-defined or texture-defined. And this was all a way of trying to unpack where in the brain we were seeing differences. And we were doing it all using eye tracking. We didn't have to do brain imaging to find out what's going on in the brain. So that's part of the, the moral of the story today. You take the tool out of the toolbox that's most parsimonious for asking the question you want to ask. So what we did is we varied the contrast levels of both types of stimuli um, so that we would get what the psychophysicists like to call a psychometric function. When something is very high contrast, you should be able to see it like close to 100% of the time, so your eye should get there. If it's low contrast, you're, the, the amount of time you'll spend looking there is going to drop off. So you'll get this nice psychophysical function, which I'll show you in a moment. And right now, I'm going to show you what these stimuli look like. You can be a baby in one of these experiments. They look towards the screen, and there's a nice second order motion stimulus. That's just an attention getter. This one should be a little harder to see, but you might have seen it on the left hand side. This one's on the right hand side, a little harder to see. The ones that are hard to see have lower contrast. That's a very high contrast one, so you all saw that on the right, etc. <clears throat> so that's the kind of experiments we did with these babies. This is the kind of data we would get, beautiful psychophysical functions. So in this first paper, we decided to show the raw data from these infants um, to demonstrate. Like, So this is not smoothed. It is not uh, averaged. This is one baby with typical development. Um, in gray, and one baby with fragile X syndrome in, in dark. So we can just demonstrate that we get a beautiful psychophysical function when the contrast is low towards the 10 or, in the, in the case of the second order, yeah, 10 or 20% contrast, you're getting close to 50% accuracy of looking at that side of the screen. When the contrast is high, it gets high. And what I want you to sh what you sort of notice in these four quadrants is only in quadrant D do those lines between the baby with fragile X and typical development start to diff you know, sort of really diverge from one another. That is the only quadrant in which we found difference on second order motion stimuli. Here's an, another way of looking at the exact same data, but with bar graphs. So this is detection threshold. So that is, how much contrast does there have to be for you to get your eyes there to the correct side 75% of the time or more, okay? And so for typically, and again, that's how the psychophysicists do it, so that's how we did it. Typically developing kids and kids with fragile X were not different for any of these 
except for the second order motion stimuli. So they had a selective second order motion detection impairment in, in babies with fragile X syndrome. So data from that showed us that, okay, that's consistent with a dorsal stream difference, but more specifically, this told us it was intentive tracking. And we knew that because that second order motion was the only time they had trouble with moving things. And if it was only just a very sort of simple, dumb dorsal stream problem, then we should have seen differences on the luminance defined moving stimuli too, and we didn't. So it was like taking these little paths and unpacking this puzzle. And we thought, okay, so if it's only the second order motion stimuli, this sounds like attentive tracking to us. And attentive tracking involves space and time. So this was part of Faraz's dissertation, right? So how do we sort of unpack this story? Let's crawl further down this, this puzzle. Um, how can we see if it's the spatial aspects or you know, space or the temporal aspects? that they're having trouble with. Um, and I showed this picture of a baby who's looking at fish in an aquarium, because you can imagine for a baby, that's the problem, that, that problem space for them to solve. Things are going in and out, these fish are moving, they're going behind occluders, and to have attentive track, to be able to track a fish, you have to not only see, yes, that's a fish, I can pull it out from the foreground, but you have to have attentive tracking. You have to be able to, to watch it go, and you have to keep it in mind as it moves behind a barrier, et cetera. Okay, so how do we do that? We looked at the spatial resolution of attention se separately from the temporal resolution of attention. Um, so Faraz came up with this interesting design of looking at um, crowded and uncrowded. Again, thinking about what the vision scientists were doing, we decided to use the same kinds of stimuli. So in this, these are Mooney faces. Who remembers Mooney faces from Psych 1? Okay, David raised his hand. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, so Mooney faces look like this. Um, these are not real faces, but the, but the one on the left looks like a face, right? Um, all it is is blobs of dark and light, but it's a configural gestalt that looks like a face. The one on the right is an inverted moody face. What we know about babies, and, and all people actually, is that we prefer to look at upright than inverted faces. We knew that from baby literature already, but at this point, no one had ever used Mooney faces with babies before. Okay, so we had to run 300 typically developing babies um, across the age range of about nine to 18 months to make sure that, that in fact, number one, they would prefer upright Mooney faces, they did, um, and to see what that psychophysical function should look like in a typically developing kid, so we did all that work. Um, that was the psych science paper. But in this paradigm, we had Mooney faces. This is a Mooney face here, upright versus inverted. In the uncrowded uh, condition of this experiment, all you had to do as a baby is look at the screen and snap your eyes to the one you preferred. Again, it's all passive viewing, so we don't tell them to do anything. We just sit a baby in front of it and see where they look. And in fact, they did prefer the upright face. Then we made it a little bit more interesting. We crowded those stimuli by putting little pieces of Mooney faces around the Mooney face. This is a crowding experiment done in many um, aspects of vision science, and we always know that it makes the decision, the visual decision, harder. In terms of that psychophysical function that we like to have, because I like to get those psychophysical functions because it's not a matter of do you see it or don't you see it, it's a matter of how much do you need to see it. What we did is we put them into the periphery, either close or far out, right? The farther those faces go out into the periphery, the, the more you should lose that preference to look for one and the other, right? So that was the premise behind this, and this is the data that we saw there. First of all, neurotypical kids are in white and fragile X babies are in, in gray. Um, uncrowded is always easier than crowded, um, so that's no big surprise. Um, 
But the, what was a big surprise was that Fragile X babies had no problem with this. They were simply just exactly like the neurotypical babies, where they would look, look a little bit longer at the uncrowded, but had the same preference, right? Um, so that told us, okay, infants have a spatial resolution of attention, infants with Fragile X, that is not impaired. Okay, cross that off of the decision tree when we're trying to unpack this story. Not, not, no problem with spatial, how about temporal? Let's try temporal. So for the temporal resolution of attention, we used a completely different kind of paradigm. We used um, this, this flicker task. Again, a very popular task to use in adult vision science, but we used it on an eye tracker with babies. So here you have an attention getter, as we always try to get their, their vision back to the, to the uh, at the start of the trial. And then one of these, th these are our squares flickering, and one is flickering out of phase. So in other words, it's this box flickering out of phase. What it looks like is it's going back and forth, right? So over time, this box is flickering out of phase. And what we varied, again, to get that nice psychophysical function that we like, is how fast that was going. So we varied at 0.2 to 2 hertz. Just to give you an idea, 0.2 is about 5 seconds. So that's really slow. All the way to 2 hertz, which is about half a second, right? So either that box was flickering out of flays like this, um, uh, uh, well, we're going boom, 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 real fast flicker, okay? So that's essentially what we did with those babies. And here's what we found, and this was surprising um, in a couple of different ways. First of all, you do see a difference between the neurotypical and the fragile X babies, so there was definitely a difference here. But what really surprised us was how terrible <laughs> the actual temporal resolution of attention was, even for the neurotypical babies, right? So they were really only getting um, above chance, which in this case, of course, there's four quadrants, so that's 25%, um, when you were really, really getting quite, quite slow, right? So they're, they're above chance here and barely above chance here at one. Um, so, well, we found out that babies are just bad at this, but <laughs> importantly, Babies with fragile X were significantly worse. So this helps us unpack our story. It's dorsal deficit, but is it space or time? It's time. It's the temporal aspects of visual attention that were different. Um, and of course, this was the another way of depicting like how bad babies were at this overall. So this is all a, a neurotypical and adults have a phase individuation threshold, we can do it at about 10 hertz, um, but at 15 months, it goes all the way down to one hertz, right? In that story that I'm telling, we, I said we also looked at it um, in the, on the fra fragile X spectrum. So we, we have done work in premutation carriers. In this case, it was um, adults with premutation. And we found um, something quite similar, which is that, that that sort of dorsal, in this case, the WEN pathway activation during what during temporal more than spatial working memory in adults with a fragile X premutation, um, we saw very big differences in brain imaging. So we've done these kinds of experiments, a little bit different. Here you have a star that's coming temporally, one, two, three, four, and we we asked them to tell us, okay, when did you, you know, is this a place where the star was, etc. Um, so again, the, the actual details, we probably don't have time to unpack them, but found a big brain difference too, not on the spatial aspects of, of working memory, but the temporal aspects of working memory. So lining up in the premutation, very much the same kind of results we saw in the Fragile X syndrome. And this was kind of, you know, really, um, telling for us. Because remember what I said at the beginning, which was that at that time, there was a time not long ago when people really wanted to believe that there were no cognitive differences in those with a premutation and then the carriers with fragile X syndrome. But, and, and when you see them, they don't have intellectual disability and they're functioning very highly in the world. But when you get them in the scanner, you can see some of these things. So we were able to say no, um, the, 
it's, it's at a different level, but we're still seeing things similar to what we're seeing in Fragile X syndrome. We also, in this case, saw a dose response of brain activation to fMR1 gene expression. So in this case, um, we saw uh, repeat size and fMR1 mRNA both correlating with this uh, difference between activation in the spatial and the temporal. Um, so again, seeing something similar to what we saw in the babies in older people with the Fragile X premutation. So a summary of the dorsal stream differences in, in Fragile X spectrum is that we showed that infants with Fragile X show intact uh, processing of first and second order static visual stimuli and a difference in the second order, but not first order, motion processing. So infants with Fragile X are able to show intact spatial resolution of attention with an impaired temporal resolution of attention. And both findings are consistent with a failure of attentive tracking, which is one aspect of dorsal stream functioning. And in young adult Fragile X permutations carriers, we showed atypical brain activation during, again, temporal visual processing. So these are ways that we use both eye tracking and neuroimaging, not only to tell us what we're seeing you know, what we can't see in some ways um, when we're looking at them in the clinic, but what we can see when we use these psychophysical or neuroimaging um, kinds of techniques. Um, so let's talk about dorsal stream differences in autism, which we've also looked at. So um, some of the prior evidence before we started any of this work um, were things like showing that People with autism were worse, had worse performance on global motion processing. So just um, can you tell whether dots in a random field are moving in one direction versus the other? Um, differences in biological motion processing, again, those point light walkers that I, that I showed or talked about before. And also recognition of emotional state in biological motion stimuli. And also there had been some work on second order uh, motion processing showing differences in autism. So there was all this work to, sh uh, prior work to show that yes, we're seeing something that's similar what, to what I've been talking about, which is really consistent with this dorsal stream um, difference. So uh, we used visual, uh, diff different um, um, biological motion stimuli to unpack this story too. We use eye tracking and neuroimaging using those psychophysics methods, again, looking at those psychophysical functions, to determine how brain regions were uh, processing dorsally mediated stimuli. And this study was led by Cami Coldwine, another brilliant trainee in my lab, who is now a professor at Bangor um, in Wales. Um, and she sought to determine if these differences are bottom-up, sort of from er very early processing areas, or top-down, a result of uh, attentional or cognitive networks. Um, and it's really functional neuroimaging that allows you to, to answer that kind of question. So we took that tool out of the toolbox and put um, children who um, were autistic in the scanner and showed them these kinds of stimuli. And this is, uh, there's a picture of Cami, um, present day. Um, and these were stimuli presented at six different coherence levels. So again, getting that psychophysical function. We did coherent motion, which is you've got dots all over and you just are asking the participants, are the dots moving in that direction or that direction? And that's the task. Um, we did coherent form. So that's where you don't have anything moving, but you've got going from a percentage of dots lining up along a pattern of contours from zero, this is completely random, to 100%. So you can see that that's like in a circular pattern, right? So that's coherent form. And then biological motion displays. In this case, we embedded the biological motion, so those point lot walkers, in random visual noise in the back. So we're asking, is the walker moving left or is the walker moving right? But you also had to pull them out of the random noise in the back. And we did this both with eye tracking and in the scanner. So here's another, um, here I'll show you what the, the coherent motion task looks like. So can you tell which way those dots are moving? Yeah, you got it. Very good. Intact dorsal streams in the, in the audience. Uh, 
there's a point light walker moving there. Can you tell what direction they're moving in? Yeah, very good, okay. So everybody's got intact dorsal streams. Um, and so that's the task, but those were pretty uh, high coherence. So imagine if we embed that walker that you saw moving that way in more visual noise, it gets harder and harder to do that. So again, we want that psychophysical function. With a, with a little bit of noise, it should be easy to make that decision. As we up the amount of noise, it'll get harder and harder so we can see that. We wanted to use these psychophysical functions because it isn't adequate to ask, can they see it or can't they, right? It really is much more subtle in the visual system. So the question is how much coherence or how much contrast is needed for them to be able to do it? So for co coherent form, just where you say, is, can you see them lined up in some kind of um, f fashion, either a circle or like a burst? Um, no difference between the two groups. Uh, autism and control were just, neurotypical kids were just, just as good at that. Um, and they, the groups entirely overlapped. Um, this suggests that differences were specific to dynamic stimuli, not the integration that we made them do when we were pulling things up. And it argues that differences on other tasks can't be due to inattention, right? So we put these, these folks in the scanner and we ask them to do these things and if they're bad at it, maybe they're just not paying attention or they're looking elsewhere. So, so we knew that they could do a task if it was coherent form. How about coherent motion? Well, we did see a difference. It was a significant difference, um, but you can see the large intersubject variability by looking at those error bars, especially in the autism group. Um, and you can see that too as we overlay uh, the proportion correct here. Um, so again, the autism group and control group are not overlapping, there's a difference. However, when we controlled for IQ on that coherent motion task, those differences went away. So that was, was somewhere where we said, well, that doesn't seem to be a core difference in autism. It could be that certain groups of people with autism might have that difference, et cetera. When we move to biological motion differences, that's where we really did see quite large differences. Again, still a lot of variability. Um, large inter, in both groups actually, right here. Um, but here, these two sort of um, lines that we're plotting were almost non-overlapping, right? Um, and that difference when you control for IQ completely does not remove that significance, right? So we really feel that this was an, an area of true difference between groups, the biological emotion. And um, for, so in summary, we saw no group differences in coherent form for our aut autism group, no overall group differences in coherent motion, but individual subject differences in this task may be defining sort of phenotypic subtypes within the autism spectrum. And biological motion perception really may be an area of, of true difference. Um, CAMI also did neuroimaging data um, in developmental science. We published that in 2011. And again, most consistent with a difference in dynamic attention, just like what we saw in, in Fragile X, both spectrum, you know, Fragile X syndrome and Fragile X spectrum. So really, these are differences that are mediated by these frontal parietal networks, a true dorsal stream difference. So the second example that I wanted to tell you about today um, is about limbic system circuitry. So the limbic system, often thought of it, that sort of emotional brain system, involves um, famously the amygdala, um, but also hippocampus and some orbital frontal cortex. So there's a whole circuit that's involved in this limbic circuitry. And we've looked at this in autism. We've looked at it in the fragile X spectrum, both fragile X syndrome and uh, girls uh, with Fragile X, people who were a mosaic for Fragile X, and premutation carriers. So a little bit about the limbic system experiments that we've done. First, let's ask that question again. Why study limbic system circuitry in both Fragile X and autism spectrums? Many aspects of the phenotype of both conditions maybe due to differences in the way the brain takes in and organizes visual information. 
First, we're going to talk about the tasks that we're using primarily to look at um, this. And we're kind of capitalizing on something called attentional bias. Um, and attentional bias, particularly towards threat among anxious population, is a relatively robust phenomenon. So brain imaging studies of what is the classically known um, task called dot probe um, in healthy adolescents uh, show a robust ventral lateral prefrontal cortex activation as well as this frontal amygdala circuitry connectivity. And these are regions found to be associated with anxiety. And I mentioned at the very beginning when I was talking about the overlap in the phenotype of these two conditions, that anxiety is a major presenting um, uh, part of the phenotype in both. Um, so we, we chose to really uh, use this as part of the, the paradigms that we use to look at these brain differences. This is uh, work that was really spearheaded by Jesse Burris in my lab. What Jesse did brilliantly is, we, is, is help me develop a version of the dot probe task that for, for, was always a button pressing task, which of course we can't do with babies, um, and we can't do easily with people with, develop, with developmental disability. So we made an eye tracking version of it. And the idea is you have faces that are, are coming up on the screen, and always an attention getter, then you show two faces, one with an, um, showing an emotion, and on one side, on the other side, a neutral face, okay? And we um, chose to present those faces for 500 milliseconds, so half a second. And then immediately after that, we have a probe that comes up on one of the two sides of the screen, either the side that had the neutral face or the side that had the emotion face whatever emotion might be showing. Um, and so these are called incongruent trials because the probe is coming up on the side that is the neutral. And these are called congruent trial because the probe is coming up on the side of the screen where it had an emotion face, okay? So just keep that in mind. We have three trial types, happy, neutral, 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 let me tell you a little secret. We never even analyze the neutral, neutral. Nobody knows why we've got those trials in there, right, Maria? We don't know. Um, everybody else did it, but we all then promptly ignore them. Um, and angry neutral. I'm just, I'm a truth teller and all of this. Okay, so what we calculate is a bias score. That's the average latency to the probe for incongruent trials minus the average latency to the probe for congruent trials. So we're trying to see how much faster they're getting there during an incongruent trial versus a congruent trial, right? The other way to think about this is if your attentional system is tuned to threat in the environment, you're looking and always kind of vigilant for something that might harm you or might be threatening to you, you're going to get there faster. Your eyes are going to tend to be on the side of the screen, sometimes already, that has that face, right? Or you're going to get over to it faster. So this is how we calculate the bias score. Um, a lot of people th ask me questions like, well, do they like to look at the eyes or the nose? Let me tell you another little secret. We don't even analyze the part of the trials that are showing the faces. I don't care. This is not a face processing task. This is an implicit kind of task that tells us how your attentional system is tuned. So the only part of the trial that we analyze is this one, when the probes comes up. How fast do you get to the probe? That's all we're interested in here. And these come fast. I'm going to play it for you so that you can see how fast that is. But first I'll tell you, the benefits of using this eye tracking version of the task for assessing attention bias. So first of all, it can be done completely via, via passive viewing, which you've already learned. I really believe in that. Um, this makes it suitable for infants, participants with intellectual disability. You can use the exact same task for any age participant too, from, from zero to 90 years old, right? Um, or above. I didn't mean to be ageist by stopping at 90. You know, any age, let's put it that way. Um, fixation latency, that is looking at how fast the eyes snap to one side. 
um, is arguably a better arguably a better measure of processing speed because you're taking that motor response out of it, right? So you're not having to sort of wait until a button press happens. So you're just this very immediate. And potentially, we think it's more directly tapping into the attentional neural mechanism underlying these affective biases. OK, so here you can be a baby in this experiment, too, or an adult, because we use the same task for babies and adults. This is the, uh, the passive viewing uh, dot probe task. And so on. OK, so before we go on to data, impressions from being a, uh, an experiment up in that task? Hard. It's fast. <laughs> You're all going, uh, uh, it's fast. So usually when I show people, especially students in my classes, like, OK, which side was the, and they're like, what? I, I mean, I know there were faces, but uh, I don't know. I saw faces, and then? stars came up, right? So I, I show it to you and, and point that out to sort, of sh to sort of make the point that this is an implicit task. It's not about faces or processing. Um, in fact, those are pretty slow. You can present these faces even faster to adults. And there are actually neuroimaging studies that present the faces at 15 milliseconds. That is precognition. <laughs> when you ask participants that are said, I didn't see any faces, you still get an attention bias, right? And so I really don't think of this as, as processing of faces at all, but really something that could get into that implicit tuning of the attentional system. This is what we see. This is under review right now. Um, Jesse is the le lead author on this paper in autism when we've done this with uh, participants with autism. So these, this is uh, about 46 um, kiddos, 10 girls, mean age about 51 months. Um, so in autism, what we're seeing, and remember now, because we're doing that intention bias uh, calculation, Anything that you see that's above zero is a bias towards something. So if you're biased towards, you're going to see a positive you know, uh, value. If you're biased away, a negative value. This is what you see in chronologically age-matched kids to this group of autistic kids. And these are mental age match group of kids to this group of autistic kids. And you can see the difference. Both the chronological and mental age match kids have an attention bias. By the way, an attention bias is adaptive. It is normative, right? It is good to be vigilant to threat in the environment. This is adaptive and developmentally appropriate. What we find, and we've done lots of experiments with lots of typically developing kids from as young as nine months all the way to seven, eight, or nine years old, and some longitudinal work that Maria here has done, and uh, it did in her dissertation, but I'm not covering today, um, uh, we've seen that you should have a bias towards, you know, some kind of emotion bias. Um, but that, in fact, if you have a strong emotion bias as a baby, that doesn't go away. So it just keeps persisting over time. Um, you're more likely to have more anxiety symptoms. And this is just in a group of typically developing kids, right? So there's something really underlying your attentional system that's telling there. But in autism, we saw this. And this was an unusual pattern when we've done all of these experiments with, with typically developing kids. And, and the data with Fragile X that I'll show you in a moment, it's quite unusual to see a bias away. You see it sometimes, but it's not common. And so we. Um, really took a little further look at that data in autism and asked about um, the emotion bias pattern. Um, and, and, and in fact, these in the dark bar are, are kids with, um, who are autistic. And they, that biased away, the proportion of kids in that group that are biased away 
are far greater than, than in the other um, no biased or biased towards. Um, so it really se seems to be something very specific to that. And um, you know, we, we will, you know, time will tell what that actually means. We've got some other data where we looked at emotion bias score by ADOS score, and there's a strong correlation there. So the higher the ADOS severity score, the, the less, you know, the more biased away they were. Um, and uh, we saw a positive correlation with the Vineland score. So, so it's possible that that's something really about that, that, um, that phenotype there. Um, when we look at the same kind of data in Fragile X syndrome, so these are children with Fragile X, uh, we see a really different um, pattern, and this was something we published back in 2017. So the, you can see here, if you look at the bias on angry trials in particular, so that's really that threat bias, not just the emotion bias. It is very pronounced in Fragile X syndrome. Remember, we saw this bar be negative in autism. It is very, very significantly higher than normal in Fragile X syndrome. So again, some bias is normative, and, you, and one could argue adaptive, and you'll see that these chronologically and mentally age-matched, typically developing kids also have some bias. It's just much higher and fragile X. And that's consistent with the very high level of, uh, levels of anxiety we see in fragile X. Um, but we're still trying to unpack why that's different in autism. So fragile X has large attention bias towards angry faces, and in fact, towards happy faces, where you see typically developing kids also are biased toward, they like all emotion, right? They're biased towards any emotion, maybe because they're really, um, at that young age, really attuned toward emotion in general, um, there's, there's a, compared to neurotypical children, the fragile X attention bias uh, towards happy is reduced. Um, and that's also seen in populations with anxiety. So this is real consistent data. Uh, this data pattern is really consistent with an anxiety phenotype. So um, we also have looked at limbic system circuitry differences in fragile X spectrum. Um, and we saw re reduced fear-specific amygdala activation in girls with fragile X syndrome, some work that I did a little bit earlier in my career, and boys and girls with mosaicism. And so this is some work that we did in the scanner um, with um, a, a, a grant that I had to look at sort of a mixed, uh, these were children that were about eight to 12 years of age, um, and we were really looking at whether or not we would see this fear-specific amygdala activation on this face, this face task. Uh, so we were looking at scrambled versus happy versus uh, fearful faces. Um, and we definitely saw that was different in girls with fragile X and boys and girls with mosaicism. So you can think about those categories, girls with fragile X syndrome, or boys or girls with mosaicism, as all kids with fragile X who have some protein production, right? So some FMRP um, to, to work with. Um, and, and thereby, when we look at it as related to gene expression, we see these strong correlations. So this is this is this how much activation you're seeing towards this fear-specific amygdala activation, and it correlates very well with both um, with gene expression in the right and in the left amygdala, okay? So there's almost like what you can think of again as a dose response of brain activation to fMRI gene expression in the amygdala. Uh, we also see some limbic circuitry differences in spe fragile X spectrum when we lo looked at amygdala activation in men with the fragile X premutation. This is work that David and I did early on when we were looking at our limbic studies as we called them, when we were looking at younger men with the premutation long before they were expected to develop symptoms of fax tasks. And we saw differences when we did things like this task, which turns out to be a really hard task that we do with people in the scanner. Two faces up here, and does the one down here match? So if that's, you know, which one matches? These two match, right? So it's actually one that even controls are like, wait, what? Uh, so, so the accuracy is actually really low on this task. But we don't care so much about behavioral accuracy as we do what the brain is doing. Um, so we see differences in fragile X premutation carriers there. And again, a dose response of brain activation to fMRP, or the protein expression, in um, amygdala. So this is uh, 
left and right amygdala activation as a function of how much fMRP, how much protein they're expressing. And we have that data from our colleagues like Paul Hagerman and Flora Tassone, who we worked so closely with to get that molecular data that we could use to correlate with the brain imaging data. So in conclusion, both eye tracking and brain imaging techniques have allowed us to investigate differences in these brain systems these ones that I chose to focus on today, in both fragile X and autism spectrums. And we target these, can we target these pathways for intervention, especially in young children, is an obvious sort of next question for us. So I dabble here in this very last slide about some potential avenues for intervention. Um, in development, we can think about attention training paradigms, and we have thought about that. So this is ongoing sort of thought work, more than data that I have to show you today, about gaze contingent paradigms that we can use for increasing temporal resolution of attention. So this has been done for things like gap overlap and cognitive control sustained attention paradigms um, in infant research. So those are ways that you can sort of train and tune the attentional system by using these gaze contingent paradigms. So it's not too far-fetched to think that there might be ways of using these kinds of eye tracking or visual visual attention paradigms to sort of retrain the attentional system. And then another way we thought about this is something that's been done, in, especially in anxiety, um, to some degree, to, to some varying degrees of, of success, which is attention bias modification. So again, some efficacy in anxiety disorders have been found, and, and we started piloting this using our eye tracking tasks with typically developing infants who show a persistent threat bias, the ones that I mentioned before, and increased anxiety to, uh, symptoms over a two-year longitudinal study. So um, again, avenues for research that I don't have data on yet, but ways to think about how this very basic science that I showed you today, sort of, un, you know, sort of looking under the hood and unpacking what's actually going on at different levels of the brain, may someday lead to ways that we can actually have avenues for intervention in these things that we're seeing that are true differences in the brain. So Susan, I want to ask you a question from the kind of neuroaffirming orientation. The fact that you found differences in these disorders, why does that, just because there's a difference in processing, why does that imply that we should be trying to norm, or change and normalize these patterns? Could this not be related to some of the strengths that are that we see in processing in people with autism? Yeah, thank you for asking that, Sally. I'm so glad you did, because I definitely think about that a lot. And um, I'll start answering that question by the, the second example that I dug into, which is the limbic system circuitry. And I think that one way, um, you know, we always try to think about when we think about what should be changed, right? Yeah, differences might just be differences, and they could even relate to strengths, as you said. Um, always about the person living their best life, right? So when it's related to something that has anxi an anxiety component, and we know that, um, for example, having an attentional system that's really tuned, overly tuned, or, or not overly tuned to, um, these kinds of emotions, is that something that is sort of driving the phenotype? Now, it's very interesting in autism that we see this look away, this bias away. That may, in fact, be not something that you want to train out of them at all, right? In Fragile X, it's very clear that they have not only an attention bias, but a really pronounced threat bias, and that also they have really, really clear anxiety and like social anxiety and they don't, you know. Um, so, so that might be something that not having that attentional system tuned in that way can actually reduce the bias, or, or I'm sorry, reduce the anxiety, right? So that's some place where that could be an avenue for intervention. Do we want to train um, a person who's autistic? Do we want to train their attentional system to not be biased away from emotion? Not necessarily, right? Because that may be something that, that would be very adaptive for them or might be a coping you know, mechanism that helps them stay regulated. 
right? So I think it's really important to think about those things when you think, okay, you know, I threw in the avenues of intervention because I think it behooves us and, we're, it, and we should be obligated to think about that, where it leads to the person living their best life, and obligated to think about where messing with that may actually reduce either something that's working for them adaptively or something that's related to a strength and we don't even know it, right? So I, I take your point very well. Can I ask a follow-up question? Of course. Okay. Um, so in the group with autism, you had a, a, a response you didn't expect. But it sounds like, unless you have, do you have measures of it, levels of anxiety? Do you know that all the children in the sample, in fact, do have problems with anxiety? Or is that an assumption based on the diagnosis? Right. So for that particular sample, we did have um, anxiety. Uh, scores, um, but not for every single child. So we couldn't do the right analysis where we would be able to do that because we were missing enough of the anxiety um, sort of data. So I can't answer that question directly. So do you know, in fact, that the looking away is associated with the experience of anxiety or, or looking towards or looking away associated with the experience of anxiety in people? based on the response to faces? We don't know that for that sample, right? No, so we're making that assumption based on what we know from other data, et cetera. Um, and it's not looking away, right, from the face. It's the attentional bias, right? So where, where does your attention tend to hang? One, you know, in, in a place where something was before, right? So it tells us that your system's sort of tuned that way. Um, but you're right, one-to-one -one for that particular sample of data in, in autism in particular, we don't have that data. So we're making some assumptions like, oh, this is interesting, that we see a pattern that's really not, we don't typically see in any of the other groups that we've looked at, but we can't, in this data set, directly assess that. In another study we could, but not in this one. So is it possible that if you did the intervention and you normalized the patterns you're seeing, it might not affect the person's experience of anxiety at all? That is possible. Okay. That is possible. Thanks. That was a wonderful talk. That's and nice so to clear. Thank you. <clears throat> and such interesting data. And this is possibly touching on the intervention and the issues that Sally was talking about. So I'm thinking it's a little chicken and an egg question because your tasks are inevitably pulling on the training set of lived visual attention mm -hmm. and the statistical properties of what faces are getting looked at, if any faces are getting looked at, or which circumstances there is uh, more lack of embodied threat which might increase the percentage of looking at neutral faces, which would then bias expertise in that non-conscious system. Mm -hmm. So to what extent do you think things like biological motion um, and these paradigms are in some sense just an indirect readout of the way people are moving through the world? I mean, I, th I, I think it has to be, in some ways, an indirect readout, right? Um, I mean, I think it's really, a really, as always, Cliff, a really, like, very um, astute way of framing it, right? But we are a product of our interactions with the environment. So right? do we need to have knowledge of the training set for the child? when we interpret the laboratory measure. That would be best, right? So we're making assumptions, <laughs> as we do in any psychophysical or any other kind of experiment, about a training set that we believe is normative, right, for humans walking about in the world. But of course, when we're talking about these, these populations, we can't make those assumptions necessarily. Right. right. Um, so yeah, in a perfect world, we would know that training set, right? We would have, I don't know, AI or something that followed them around right. for a month and said, what is the training set? Okay, I'm designing an experiment in my head that I'm never going to do, but that would be really good, yeah. right? Um, and, and so that could, in fact, be much more informative than basing it on 
decades of, of psychophysical vision science and sort of saying, well, let's assume that's our starting point and then see how we're diverging from it. Because that assumed starting point assumes a certain training set, as you put it. Right. Um, so yeah, that's a very good point. Because I, I just think of those, the bar graphs you gave of the proportion of autistic kids who were biased toward the emotion, and you had this other group that was biased away. Yeah. And there may be really interesting differences in the way they go about their lives. That's yeah. right. That's right, Attention. and what they see, yeah, yeah. And, and what they and what they see is dependent on how they're going about their lives, yeah, right? Because yeah, yeah. we have choices as humans about what we want to look at, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, so, really important point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. In your limbic studies, um, did, did am I interpreting your results correctly that in the anxious phenotypes you didn't see increased amygdala activity, you so saw reduced? So we see reduced amygdala activity. Yeah. So I, I mean I. I would have thought maybe it would, you would get the opposite result, uh, but uh, I wondered if there were other regions of the brain that showed increased activity in the anxious children, or whether you looked at connectivity between regulatory areas in the amygdala or other aspects of the limbic network that, to, that would sort of help you to explain that anxious phenotype. Right. So, th so um, this is young men with their premutation. Yep. Um, they are, uh, as a whole more anxious. Um, we did look at a direct sort of correlation between anxiety um, uh, scores, right? So ang the ang anxiety um, psycho uh, psychophys neuropsychology, right? And this, this sort of reduced amygdala activation. So in fact, what we saw was those who are more anxious are showing reduced amygdala activation different from what you see in other populations, for example. But we have to remember what the task is. And the task is really a matching emotion task. It's not looking at anxious faces, right? Um, so it's hard, you know, in the paper we try to sort of say, well, that's maybe a little bit unexpected. But in, in fact, um, it's hard to know whether being anxious about, you know, in general in the world really relates to this particular activity, which is not about interpreting anger faces. It's about matching which face matches with the one below it, right? So, um, so you're right, it is a bit of an un unexpected difference, though it was a robust difference that we saw. So we thought, okay, this is something about this group that's different than the control group that we're looking at. Um, but we can't directly match it in the sense that we, you would think it would go, in the direction you would think it would go, which, in the direction that you often see it go in other parts of the literature, which is increased amygdala activa activity for anxious populations. But the task is usually a face viewing task of an angry face or some threat sort of kind of face. And this is a different task than that. So. Um, you know, we kind of racked our brains about it. I think it may have a little bit to do with um, inability of the uh, of the sort of limbic systems to sort of like coordinate towards the task, etc. Um, so it's it's hard to make a direct correlation for that reason. But I but we have other tasks in the premutation carriers where we've looked just at face processing, and there you do see the expected increased amygdala. So I think it is, you know, sort of part of the anxiety phenotype. Why it went the other way for this task, we can only speculate about that. You know, one, one, one thought that, that I had was, uh, I wonder if you've looked at the betas for the different conditions that go into the contrast maps and, and whether there's increased activity in the, the matching for neutral faces. Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't remember doing that. Um, I don't know that we have enough of the different kinds of faces. Yeah, I'd have to go, but I don't know that I will. I'm going to be honest, I probably won't do this. But it's a good suggestion. <laughs> when I think about, I'm so honest, um, but when I think about um, sort of do we have enough to sort of just look at when the match is with neutral versus when the match is with angry, we probably just don't have enough 
to look at those betas, but it would be it would be a good idea. And a better experiment would be designed to look at that in particular, right? So. What you would like to do at University of Maryland, sorry, in terms of research, what is on the horizon? What's you, on the Susan? horizon? Well, well, first on the horizon is writing our renewal, right, David? Oh, well, <laughs> did you have to say that? <laughs> So Besides we have to that. get busy. Um, th so, um, you know, I'm really in this administrative role now. So I, I think that, you know, I'm really focused on collaborative work. Um, new, so, so continuing our, our work together is really important to me. New horizons that I wouldn't mind getting into is thinking a little bit more about sort of lived experience. And, um, and so I've been really thinking, sort of noodling a lot and thinking that it would be really fun to think about more sort of ecological moment to moment kinds of data collection um, using some of the really um, fascinating sort of AI and machine learning work that's been used to sort of understand the lived experience of people with developmental disability. Um, and, and I think that, you know, why do that? First of all, it's just kind of cool and interesting. But more importantly, I, I think there's still a lot for us to learn about um, the day-to-day -day experience of people with these conditions. And what, and, and again, kind of like the conversation we were having before, the assumptions that we're making that are underlying those, those experiences that may be wrong assumptions, right? And, you know, I think, I think that's kind of a lot of where my mind has been going lately. So I can imagine work moving more in that direction. You know, one of the things that is so unique about your research is really the work with infants with fragile X syndrome. You're probably the only person really in the world with this kind of a systematic program. That, and it's, you know, one of the opportunities there, which is hard to do in five year grant cycles, is, um, you know, you talk about this as kind of the, the precursor and there are downstream consequences of basic visual processing for social phenomena. And so did you, have you had an opportunity or would, would you want to look at some of these kids longitudinally to look at what are, you know, for example, can we predict who's more likely in, in the, among fragile X infants to begin to show symptoms of autism or things like that? So have you had that opportunity yet? Because I think, again, you're the only person really that's done infant sighting. Yeah, and <clears throat> let me just say, I'm not confused about this. There's a reason I've, I'm the only person who's been able to, to collect this amount of data that's an order of magnitude more than anyone else, and that really was because I was here at the Mind Institute, um, where Rondi Hagerman has the biggest and most well-known Fragile X clinic in the world, um, and so where other people were scrambling to collect 20 infants with Fragile X, I was collecting my 300th infant with fragile X. Um, and so thank you, Rondi, for giving me the opportunity, but also just the Mind Institute for being my home, um, my intellectual home for being able to do that. Um, yeah, that would be a really, really great um, uh, program of research. And we did do longitudinal work with the, with the fragile X. So even my early R01s were longitudinal ones, where we had to have two data points. Um, but I have always dreamed of being able to follow these children, much like we're doing with the fragile X permutation carriers, where David and I have now been following them for 15 years um, over long periods of time. Because understanding what some of these very early basic sensory processing differences mean for later development and, and phenotypic outcomes, um, I think would be fascinating, but also potentially really important. Um, and, and we know from some of the work that we've been able, the longitudinal work that we've been able to do in typically developing kids, we followed them for six or seven years. Even that was telling us something really important that we could have never gotten cross-sectionally. Right? We would have never predicted some of the things by just bringing them back and having them come back year after year. So that would be the holy grail of data collection. It's both expensive and extraordinarily difficult to do, but if anyone would pay me to do it, <laughs> um, I would think that that would just be a, a career uh, topping uh, kind of pro program of research. Um, did you have some extra cash laying around for that kind of thing? No? Okay. Okay. Just, just curious. Um, but th thank you for that, that question.
The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.